Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 71st session of the MedAI Group Exchange Sessions. This week, we have Sajid Fuladwand from Stanford here with us to speak about his work on um, opioid use disorder prediction. Sajid is a postdoc at the Stanford Center of Biomedical Informatics um, Research, and his work has been focused on developing and applying artificial intelligence algorithms to solve real-world healthcare problems. And prior to Stanford, he worked at the Institute of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Kentucky while completing his PhD in computer science. And at Stanford, he's involved in conducting AI and um, healthcare data science research in close collaboration with clinicians, scientists, and healthcare systems with access to deep clinical data um, warehouses and broad population health data sources. So thanks so much, Sajjan, for joining us today. Yeah, of course. And um, I know you told us just before that you'd um, like like to have uh, audience interact during the presentation. Um, so um, yeah. yeah, so let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Um, and without further ado, let me hand it over to um, Sajid. Thank you very much, Nandita, for the introduction and for having me. Uh, happy to be here and uh, feel free to interrupt me if there is any question uh, while I present. Uh, so I'll be I'll be presenting. Uh, so my background is in computer science, but I've always had a passion for applying computer science and AI and machine learning in healthcare domains. And during my PhD uh, at University of Kentucky and here as a postdoc at Stanford, I have had I I have been more focused on using AI in addiction including opioid use disorder. I have some experience with Alzheimer too, which was during a short summer internship at uh, Mayo Clinic. So uh, we, in this study, uh, we, were, we were trying to explore if we can use, if AI and machine learning can be used in, to help patients with opioid use disorder. Uh, to give you a background, uh, opioid is a group of medication that uh, patients typically get prescribed with because of uh, a chronic a chronic pain, mostly, or right after a surgery. They're like uh, uh, very common, but they're they have a, a side effect, probably like many other uh, uh, medications, and the side effect is addiction and overdose. So over time, p uh, patients using opioid medications uh, may, may end up developing opioid use disorder, which is fatal and can cause lots of damage to patient health, families, healthcare. Uh, and then there is also a stigma with it. So in this term is a little bit different from maybe other conditions like a heart condition because there is a stigma with it. People don't prefer to talk about it a lot. It's harder to screen patients. There are clinical tools to ask question, ask patient questions like, do you have a family history of alcohol dependence or you have alcohol dependence or other, other questions, which might not be very easy to uh, uh, talk about. So maybe using a AI, a machine learning tool that can process a large amount of healthcare data and can create an automatic tool that can you know, analyze patient historical EHR data, what diagnosis they had 10 years ago, what procedures they've done five years ago, what prescriptions they have been receiving, how long they have been on opioid, and now can we use AI, process those data, and predict a risk score? Are they at the risk of developing opioid use disorder three months from now, six months from now, a year from now? And then if we can do that, uh, psychiatrists, physicians, and clinicians can uh, take steps to uh, prevent that opioid use disorder, or even uh, uh, maybe a start treatments with buprenorphine, naloxone, or whatever they uh, 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 think is the correct uh, uh, step to take. So uh, for this study, uh, which was mainly part of my PhD dissertation at Institute for Biomedical Informatics, University of Kentucky. 
we used uh, claims data, uh, IBM Health Market Scan claims data from 2009 to 2020, over 10 years of data, uh, formerly called TrueWin data, which is uh, insurance claims data. And uh, we extracted patients with at least one uh, opioid use disorder diagnosis in their records. We used ICD-9 and 10. Uh, and we were uh, we had psychiatrists and clinicians in our team that could tell us what ICD diagnosis are associated with opioid use disorder or can can be used to identify the cohort. We also had uh, uh, other criteria to make sure we have enough data to create an AI model. Uh, and the data and the data is not uh, super sparse. We also can exclude outliers. So we had a minimum of three opioid prescription in patient's record criteria, as long as we wanted our patients to have at least one year of data availability. And for controls, uh, uh, pretty much the same, except that, well, obviously the biggest difference is they wouldn't have any, they don't have any, uh, ICD diagnosis for opioid use disorder or uh, or any prescriptions that shows uh, they may have opioid use disorder like buprenorphine naloxone, which is typically used to treat OUD uh, to just make sure our controls do not include any uh, 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 positive patients. And then we also had the uh, uh, three opioid prescription minimum in their records plus 12 month of data availability. Uh, in terms of predictors, we used patients' uh, uh, historical medications, uh, diagnosis, procedures, and demographics, which in our data, we only had access to age and sex. Uh, we and this, we, we looked at the patient history of 10 years of data from 2009 and 2020, as I mentioned earlier. But since there are so many codes in, uh, there, there were so many codes in our data, for example, diagnosis were recorded using ICD-10 and 9 codes. And we didn't want to uh, focus on a few selected uh, features. We wanted to just create an end-to-end -end model. Of course, in our preliminary uh, study, we had another study that we only uh, focus on 10 uh, frequent diagnoses as features. But here, we wanted to look at the entire history. And to do that diagnosis, we had thousands of ICD codes. So we ended up grouping them to a higher hierarchy of uh, uh, CCS codes. For example, uh, there may be tens of ICD codes for back pain problem, but there is a 205 CCS code for lower back problem, which group uh, smaller and more detailed diagnosis into one bigger group to have a more reasonable number of features to work with uh, and to just technically make this feasibly possible. And then we also group medications based on their root classifications. Uh, we group procedures based on uh, CCS code, and we had demographic features as uh, well. Our final, final feature set in, that we use to train and test the models to predict opioid use disorder had uh, 269 features or variables. So I use feature and variable interchangeably in this talk. We Can had I ask a quick question here. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, yeah, so how, so I assume that some of the variables are like categorical variable and some are continuous, right? How, how do you encode them? Right. So in the next slide, I provide a little more details on that, but we okay. used a multi-hot encoding. So we don't, we don't, we didn't use like the dosage of the data. We just, uh, it's a binary uh, variable that says if this patient has this diagnosis, yes or no, or mm -hmm. have they been prescribed with this medication in this time, yes or no, and it's it's a multi hot uh, encoding. I see. How come you have only fifty medication? Did you pre-select the medications or fifty so, and seventy nine procedures? Right. So we we group them based on uh, the root classification medicine okay. uh, uh, identifiers. 
And then we on we excluded we 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 looked into the distribution of the medicate of the of the frequency of this uh, events or variables, and only and excluded those that are more than I think two a standard variation away from uh, the most frequent one. So don't you think that this may may be problematic for the generalization of model to another institution or another population? Uh, probably, probably. Uh, definitely would be better if we use everything we had even before grouping them, but it was a matter of trade-off for us to have a, a reasonably large and maybe a still a small feature set to work with. Okay. Uh, so we, we limited to uh, more frequent features. Okay, got it. Um, I had a quick question as well. Yeah, Actually, in, in your like previous slide, if you go back to how you select the cohort and, and uh, sorry, the control as well as your um, cohort. Um, I was curious if like an OUD treatment um, medication is like used only for OUD or does it like, is mm -hmm. it given for other things as well? And is right. that potential source of like indication or should it be something that you should account for? Right, right. Uh, that's a good question. So there are, for example, buprenorphine, naloxone, typically used for treatment, but there are scenarios when uh, that I found out this re even recently in my work on opioid use disorder at the Stanford data. There may be a patient going for a surgery and receive one, one prescription, maybe even mm -hmm. one dose for a specific uh, treatment during an inpatient visit. So this probably not the cleanest way to detect, identify cases and controls, but I'm still not sure if there is a very clear way to tell and do that do that distinction. I think this was the best uh, that we could do, but definitely there is limitation and definitely, as we know, EHR data uh, probably uh, uh, not not as clean as you would think. We would think. Gotcha. Thanks. And uh, here is more about data formatting, how we formatted our data. So we used uh, proven data, claims data. We had prescription, diagnosis, procedures, demographics. And uh, we, 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 of course, had a larger number of controls than cases. We match cases and controls based on age, sex, opioid use duration, like how long they have been on opioid medication and data availability and match the cases and controls and created a balanced data for our training, but we report the performance of the model on, both, on, all, uh, on a balanced test set and multiple different uh, imbalanced test sets to try to estimate the error in real world if you actually deploy this model in real world. And the format of data is uh, on the figure on the left here, we, for each patient, we created uh, four matrix, four matrix. Each of them is two dimensional uh, to capture the longitudinal data. Each row was one month of the uh, data availability from January uh, uh, 2009 to June of 2020, which was the data availability in our uh, uh, study. And then we have the, uh, we have like 50 columns. Each column is associated with one medication. For example, have this patient been using, been prescribed with opioid this month? Yes or no, next month, next month. And this is about all other uh, 50 medications that we uh, chose to uh, study. And then the same for 138 uh, diagnosis codes that we had, uh, also two dimensional matrix. Uh, one dimension to capture the time and one to capture the uh, multi-hot encoding of different diagnoses that the patient had in their records at some point in the past. And the procedures plus the two demographic information that we had, which doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, change by uh, time, uh, over time. And on the right is a general description of the uh, data, our final cohorts, cases and controls we had. 
we looked into the demographics, uh, similar uh, top frequent uh, medications where uh, uh, obviously opioid uh, was the most frequent medications because we selected our controls based on that antidepressant, anti-inflammatory, and for diagnosis, we had uh, a lower back pain problem. It was the most common diagnosis for people with OUD, which uh, 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 a chronic pain disease. And in one of our prior study, we only focused on people with back pain problem because this was uh, very common. But here we, we, we decided to just look at everyone using opioid, uh, everyone that have a prescription for opioid. And uh, uh, in terms of the models, we uh, used two, three category of uh, models. First was classical machine learning models, uh, logistic regression, random forest and XGBoost. Uh, we use deep learning models, uh, recurrent neural network, long short-term memory models or LSTM. Uh, we use transformer, but only the encoder part. And we also created a multi-stream transformer, which is very similar to the original transformer uh, with some slight differences, which I will uh, explain in, my, uh, in the next few slides. Uh, we also did try to compare the AI models in predicting opioid use disorder binary classification with clinical tools. Uh, one of the clinical tools that was common at the time that we were doing this study was called unweighted opioid risk tool, suggested by one of the psychiatrists and clinicians in our team uh, that I will des describe further over the next few uh, slides as well. Uh, so generally speaking, like random forest is of course a, uh, uh, I'm going to give like a background on the models that we have used or the most popular ones. Random forest is a set of trees and in a, it's a tree-based algorithm. So in a tree-based algorithm, like a decision tree, we have nodes and each node is a feature, one of our features. And then for example, the first feature is the first node is, has this patient been prescribed with opioid, yes or no? If yes, we go move to the right part. Have they also have this diagnosis, a back chronic back pain, yes, yes or no? And then this guide us through the, by looking at the feature values, guide us to a, a label, a decision. Oh, okay, based on this values for these features, uh, random for I think this patient is belong to this class or is at the risk of opioid, yes or no. Uh, one, one thing I forgot to mention about data uh, format. So this is the longitudinal format, but for, for random forest, we aggregated features, feature values and use frequencies over time to create a static data uh, because based on our preliminary studies, when, we, when you use, the patients have different, uh, different lengths of features. For example, some patients may have 12 months of data availability. Some have five years, six, six years, seven years. So the length is different. And if we concatenate all the information across time, it would be a long uh, vector with zero padding at the end. So we decided to, instead of doing that, it would be more fair to create, to stack, every, to aggregate everything and create a one dense uh, static feature to train random forest compared to say long short time memory models. So that's random forest. And for LSTM, LSTM is a type of recurrent neural network. The way recurrent neural network works is, uh, say we have a patient and they have five visits. And the first visit, we have one vector, which is a multi-hot encoding, meaning that the first entry is associated with one diagnosis, second is the other diagnosis. And then also 50 of them are associated with 
50 medications, procedures, and then demographics at the end or to the last layer. And then this is like what the first visit, we, we plug it into the first cell of recurrent neural network or in this, this study, long short-term memory model. And it's a typical uh, neural network based model in which we, what we typically do in neural network, we have an input, a raw input, and then we multiply that by, by a weight matrix and add a bias and get another vector of numbers that is supposed to capture some information and, and transfer that raw data into a new, new space where we can extract knowledge from. So we input the first visit vector information, multiply by a weight, and in LSTM, we have different gates. We have forget gates to know how much information do we want to forget or which features are important to pass to the next step. And then after this multiplication, we have a new vector, a new represented vector, and we have a second visit information. So it, we, it's like we unroll the recurrent neural network based on the number of visits the patient has. So it's, it's dynamic. And then we go to the next, next visit, multiply the raw information from next visit to the weight matrix. Also, we have the information from the past visit, aggregate, go, go to the next step and continue this on roll as long as uh, there is information dynamically based on the length of the sequence of the information that the patient has. And then that last uh, that last vector is like the encoded uh, uh, information from all the previous information, all the previous visit information, and we use that last uh, the last uh, encoded information and multiply it by the last layer to do a final prediction. We also this is the structure of our LSTM. We also try to do max pooling over all the steps, which didn't work as good as we wanted. And then the other model that we used is transformer. So when we were doing this study, uh, it was 2018, 19, 2020, and transformer was, so the reason transformer was created because this recurrent neural network and transformer were first of all, mainly created for sentence and sequence of words processing in NLP task. And we use them to, for healthcare and a structured data analysis because they have the same sequential uh, uh, nature. And transformer, the reason transformer was created was in a paper called Attention is All You Need. And the idea was, okay, in recurrent neural network, one patient may have uh, 100 time steps, 100 visits or even more. And as we move along, as we multiple the raw data to the weight matrix, go to the next and just aggregate, aggregate, and encode and encode, we may actually miss or forget some information from 50 time steps ago. Or uh, it's also technically hard, harder to train because it's like parallel, it, it can't be parallelized. Uh, so in transformer, we would just look at the association between uh, we, we remove this recurrency and we only look at the association between the visit or the information in this time step and 10th time step, how it is associated with the information in second time step. And then we find this association and call it a, a attention. And then we form a final attention matrix from all these associations and use that as attention matrix to do a final prediction. But original transformer has two parts because it was originally developed to process text, encoder and decoder. Uh, we we used uh, we used the encoder part. So we give the EHR data, give the claims data, healthcare data to transformer, encode it, and you then use that final encoder encoded vector to do a binary prediction for opioid use disorder. And uh, this is a uh, modified version of transformer that we created. So in original transformer, everything is just one sequence. Here, we tried to 
we created a transformer where we input medication, diagnosis, and procedure separately, aiming to have a model that's a little bit more transparent. Uh, and we find the attention for, for example, medication stream for one patient. We find the attention within this sequence, within this stream. And then for diagnosis, we find the attentions within this diagnosis stream. We also find the attention across these streams. And we do this for all the three input streams that we have, medication with diagnosis, medication procedures, diagnosis procedures, and extract all the attention weights and use that to do a, and then at the end, we concatenate the demographic information and have a, a prediction layer at the end to do the final, the final predictions for us. And uh, here is the unweighted uh, ORT, uh, opioid risk tool that we have, which is more of a clinical tool. So this is, this is basically a questionnaire, including uh, 10, maybe one, two, three. Yeah, 10 questions about uh, patient histories. So the way to use this tool is to clinicians have this questionnaire and have the patient in front of them and ask these questions. Do you have family history of substance use, substance abuse, like alcohol abuse, drugs, Rx drugs, or do you have a personal history of uh, substance abuse? So family history, personal history, what is your age? Uh, and then two questions about uh, psychological diseases like ADD, OCD, bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, or depression. And then there is a, based on the patient's answer to these questions, there is a score here. If they answered yes to five of them, the score would be five. And they, there is a suggested threshold, which is, I think, uh, is three. I have it later in my slides, which is it three. Okay, if you, if you answered at least uh, if you answered yes to at least three of these questions, then you are at the risk of having opioid use disorder. And this is, by the way, a very old tool used in clinics. I'm not even sure if it's uh, actually being used uh, currently or not, uh, uh, but this is something we wanted to compare. Yeah, of course, we compare AI models with each other, but we wanted to compare with some sort of clinical tool as well. And to do this perfectly or properly, uh, we would need to do a prospective study, right? So we create the model, we train the model, and then a new patient comes in, we ask them the questions, we have a score, then we, ha we have the model to output a score and we see which one is correct, and then follow up the patient for I don't know, like a year or two to see if they are actually at the risk of OUD. But uh, here we had the limitation, uh, for to do a prospective study. So for each patient in our test, we actually uh, looked into their, uh, their data and see instead of actually asking the patient and uh, if you have a family history of substance use disorder or if you have a, a psychological disease, we would look into their EHR, they, their uh, claims data, and see if they if there is any ICD codes or ICD diagnosis for uh, ADD or OCD or bipolar, and kind of simulate it using this tool for uh, uh, test patients. Uh, quick question. Yeah, does, the, does the claims data also have family history, or is that something that you had to infer? Well, there were some uh, diagnosis code and claims data for family history. We didn't have uh, clinical notes, which I guess would be a more accurate way to find that. But there are, uh, there were a diagnosis code for family history, but not okay. sure how, if they were very accurate or not. As I said, this is kind of a stigma. So, but now in like now in my current work. Uh, we are using EHR data instead of claims data. And uh, we just had a, a speaker in our lab, uh, uh, Dr. Lamke, which worked, treats with uh, treats uh, opioid use disorder patients. 
and she mentioned there's a lot of information that probably cannot be captured from a structured data, but maybe maybe you may be able to capture from unstructured nodes. Mm. But uh, yeah, so we, we did find family diagnosis related to family history, uh, but probably not 100% accurate. Got it, thanks. Uh, the data that we had was a uh, rather big data, over 474, uh, thousand patients, so uh, less than half a million patients. And for each patient, of course, we had hundreds of uh, uh, diagnosis procedures. So we had billions of records, which created lots of challenge for me personally to handle this big data, like uh, sorting the data, matching the data. Everything was different because the data was rather big. Uh, we used 426,000 patients as training and 47,000 patients in testing. Uh, classical machine learning, machine learning models were optimized using randomized three-fold cross-validation. And we trained all the models on uh, GeForce, GTX, 1080 GPUs, server on College of Pharmacy and uh, University of Kentucky. And uh, here are the results, sorry for uh, lots of numbers here. I tried to summarize it. So on the left is the performance of the model uh, on a balanced test set. Uh, the first row is logistic regression, random forest, XGBoost, long short-term memory model, which is a popular uh, recurrent neural network model. Uh, and then we have the transformer, the encoder part of the transformer, and then this mu pod, which is the, the multi-stream transformer that we created. And then for ORT or UD, ORT or UD is the tool, the clinical tool that I described. Uh, the suggested threshold is three. So if patient uh, answer yes to at least three of the questions, uh, they are labeled at higher risk patients. But just uh, for this study, we wanted to look at different thresholds as well to see how does that affect using this uh, clinical tool. So uh, overall, uh, long short-term memory model and attention-based model, transformer and multi-stream transformer, performed better in terms of uh, uh, rock area under the cur curve of rock curve, F1 score, recall, and accuracy. Uh, compared to classical machine learning and compared to the simulation of using clinical no, uh, of using, uh, excuse me, of using a uh, clinical tool. Uh, but the clinical tool had, the ORT tool had a higher precision, especially for higher thresholds in detecting or identifying patient at risk, which uh, is uh, with the cost of sacrificing a recall so the, the meaning is if the clinical tool may not be able to find a good number of patient at risk, but if they alarm, if they think this is an at risk patient, that's probably true. But the thing is, uh, this may not be the best comparison because for the machine learning model, we, we optimize the threshold, use this one threshold that has been optimized during validation. And this is like one threshold. And if you look at the ROC AUC, the ROC AUC is much higher. So meaning that if we, if we want higher precision, and if we change the decision-making threshold for deep learning or machine learning models, we actually end up with both precision and uh, higher precision and recall. For example, for example, here on the right, uh, is the same uh, models, but tested using imbalanced test sets, where uh, for each OUD positive, there, there are two OUD negatives. And uh, the performance of all the models drops because the, model, the test set is more imbalanced. And uh, here, uh, we looked at the, the, note, the note that I have here, we looked at the recall of 0 0.5 
for the multi-stream transformer, the recall is 0.88, right? But if we change the threshold and we say, oh, okay, recall 0 0.5 is good enough, then the precision for, for example, for this, for this test set is 0 0.55, which is higher than this. So by changing the, by precision at recall 50 uh, for transformer base is still higher than precision at re recall close to zero for uh, uh, the clinical two. And as we, we, we tested with different, uh, different test sets, different ratio of imbalance. Here is the test set is even more imbalanced because we wanted to see how the imbalanceness of test net, how, how rare it is. And if it's the, the level of rareness of this uh, disease, how it affects the model, which obviously all the, naturally all the models performance drop, but it's still uh, 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 multi-stream transformer performance uh, maintains the higher, uh, maintains, managed to be the higher or the most effective, mo most accurate model compared to the uh, classical machine learning models and also the uh, uh, ORT tool. Uh, we also tested for imbalance ratio of 0 0.1, which is for one opioid use disorder positive. We have uh, 10 OUD uh, negative patients. Uh, and NUPOD is still performing uh, better. Here, long short-term memory has a uh, long short-term memory model, which is a kind of recurrent neural network, has a higher f one score, but lower rock AUC uh, for this test set. And all this says, you know, there is not a best model. Uh, overally, yes, the MuPod has an if we only look as ROC AUC, which is a common assessment in healthcare domain. Yes, multi-stream transformer has the best ROC AUC, but the performance are close, and each of them has pros and cons, which could which could uh, uh, be used in different scenarios and based on the preference of the clinic and the physicians using this this tool. Uh, here is the most extreme test. Uh, uh, case scenario where the ratio is one to 100. So for each positive, we have 100 negative case. And uh, the trend is the same as the, as we, we saw in the last few uh, tables. Uh, so one thing, one uh, limitation in this work is that we predict opioid use disorder six months before the onset. So we train the model to predict six months before the onset of the disease. But it's it would be even better if we can predict the disease a year uh, before it happens. So we did look into the MuPod performance to predict the OUD disease one year before the disease happens. Uh, naturally, the performance drops uh, around 10%. And the reason is uh, the OUD uh, detecting OUD and the change in dosage and everything is more clear closer to the incident, which we look into here. So all the models were trained by binary variables. We only looked if the patient had been using opioid or not. But here we looked into the difference between uh, dosage information. So we have uh, true positives and true negatives, which are basically two subsets of uh, test sets. One group is OUD positive and one is OUD negative. We wanted to see, they both have been using opioid prescription, opioid medication, but we wanted to see how the dosage was different between these two groups. And we used morphine milligram equivalent, which is a measure which is a, a, a method to measure the amount of opioids I've been using. Like it's, it would be different if uh, one patient used uh, this dose or one pill a day and one used three pills a day. So if we look at the average amount of opioid, uh, and if we look at the all records from beginning of when they started opioid 
up until the last record that we had, regardless of when opioid happened. Mm -hmm. Averagely, opioid positive patients has 93.54 MME compared to 73. So they have been using more uh, uh, opioid MME uh, in average. And this difference is even larger as we get closer to the to when opioid use disorder happened. So this number here, uh, I don't know if you can see the pointer, oh, perfect. So this number 94.05 and 55.19 is the average, but not across all medical data that we had. It's, it's across six months before the incident happens or six months before the last record if they are negative. So, uh, you see, this this is a, a, a higher number, and the so the dosage is different, and that's one reason why it's uh, 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 you know there is a difference in in patterns. And this was one of our future work, which I didn't get a chance to work on. How can we, which might be a good question to good 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 research direction, how we can incorporate in all opioid use disorder prediction or all disease prediction. We typically use multi-head encoding, but can be incorporate like a signal of those stage of the medication, at least those that are directly associated with the outcome, can we incorporate that signal data into this multi-head encoding. And uh, we, uh, this is a little uh, side experiment that we did. We wanted to see, do the attentions we compute make any sense. It's very hard. We all know deep learning is still maybe a black box, hard to interpret attentions. And there are like a few papers in this, attention is not explanation and their attention is not not explanation. So there are like different arguments, but we look into the first layer of our model, multi-stream transformer, and we aggregated, we only looked into the association between medication and diagnosis. And we aggregated across 1,000 sample test patients and visualized it for both OUD positive patients and OUD negative patients. So the green are medication, the blue are diagnosis, and the numbers on the edges or the lines connecting these two nodes is the amount of the, the value of the attention. So there are like two points. And, it's, and again, I understand attention is not causal inference, but uh, we see the pattern, first of all, is different. We wanted to see why attention-based models, transformers can identify and discriminate OUD positive and negatives. And we see this difference in pattern here. First of all, the pattern kind, the pattern kind of makes sense because there's opioid as, as associated with back problem with high attention value or associated with nerve disorders or, and there is of course, a, uh, uh, noise in this too. But uh, first of all, the pattern, the connections are a little different. And second of all, the values are different. For example, there is the same connection for OUD negative, but the value is lower. And maybe that's how the model can tell the difference between OUD positive and OUD uh, negative. Uh, in conclusion, uh, AI models, we use 269 variables. Uh, less than half million patients, historical data over 10 years. Uh, it's automated, easier to maintain an AI model compared to come up. So the ORT tool, to come up with one of those tools, probably a committee, committee of uh, physicians, clinicians need to meet, meet and update that. So it's a lot of workload for uh, clinicians. But an auto automated AI model can be updated or fine-tuned and deployed uh, with much less effort and save clinicians lots of time while may uh, be accurate and easier to use compared to clinical notes. And of course, more prospective studies are needed to uh, explore this more. And uh, I just acknowledge my, uh, 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 I would like to acknowledge my colleagues from University of Kentucky Institute for Biomedical Informatics, Informatics and Well Cornell uh, Medicine that uh, we work together uh, uh, for this study and my ongoing project also related to this. So everything 
I talked about was before OUD happens. But what I'm working on right now with jo Dr. Jonathan Chen at Biomedical Informatic Research Center at Stanford is, okay, so if OUD happens, can we create AI models that help patients with OUD to uh, stay on treatment? Because after OUD happens, after a patient develop opioid use disorder, the physicians change the medication to opioid buprenorphine. And the, the patients are supposed to uh, stay on that medication for uh, as long as needed, like six months, a year, or maybe lifetime. But patients tend to drop out. So we are creating AI and machine learning model that can predict this patient has OUD or they are on medication, good. But this patient, there is at risk of stopping the treatment and can help the physicians to have the risk to, to know this risk. And then when, when, once they know that, they may, instead of giving the patient a refill, may ask them to come to the office or uh, I'm no expert in this field, so they may take uh, appropriate steps to help patient stay on, stay on treatment uh, uh, more. And we are also using EHR data instead of claims data. We are using a Stanford OMOP data. And we are also using clinical notes and NLP methods, which are also based on transformers. So all the large language models, chat GPT, that probably everyone heard of, they are all based on the transformer models. And we are using those models too, to predict treatment retention versus attrition. Uh, thank you very much. I know uh, Nandita said many people watch the video offline. So if you're watching this offline, feel free to email me if you have any question. Uh, happy to happy to help or share the code or whatever needed. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sajid, for the amazing talk. Um, I guess yeah. before we move on to more questions, let's give Sajid a round of virtual applause. And Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I'll leave the floor open for questions. Yeah, of course. If there is any question, happy to answer. Um, yeah, thanks, Najat. Um, I have a question about the how you um how you encode the longitudinal data. Uh, am I right that each time step is basically one patient visit? Uh, no, each time step is one month. So we kind of made, okay. created the grid, mm -hmm. and we uh we we multi hard encoding all the visits within a month. So we kind of created this grid and- I see, I see. Okay, got it. Um, and what about, so do all the patients have uh, have the same sequence lengths or? No, we use positional encoding. Mm -hmm. and then we use the, for uh, LSTM, we use uh, dynamic LSTM based on the sequence length. And okay, for transformer, we use zero padding and only use the, the sequence lengths as well. Okay, I see, got it. Um, and another question, I guess, for uh, I guess for the because you have like two hundred something variables, do you try to do um like external validation on like different institutions? And what? Because I assume like some like external data may not have. Mm -hmm the same set of variables, right? Or, or do you like, do you consider um, cases when they, there are missing values in certain variables? Uh, for this study that I mainly talked about, no, it was a single study, mm -hmm. but for the ongoing work that we are doing with the Stanford, we use OMOP data and OMOP is a uh, common data model. We are, a, we are doing a multi-sided study collaborating mm -hmm. with a company called Holmosk. And we are in the process of testing the generalizability of the model. But for the OUD prediction model, uh, no, unfortunately, we didn't do any external validation. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, I have a question as well. Yeah, so um, I know that in, in all of these cases, you've kind of formulated the problem as a binary classification. So opioid use um, disorder versus not. Um, 
did you also think about modeling it as a regression problem where you give a progressive risk score to patients um, to kind of evaluate when they might be at risk and, and until what threshold or, or something like that? Uh, that's that's a very good question, but uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to do that. At some point, we did have an idea to, I think we did do a, one experiment to have the recurrent neural network to output a risk score at every time of steps to see the change of the uh, time of steps, but we didn't get to finish that or focus on that, that direction, but definitely a good direction, especially if you combine it with the dosage information, which is also continuous float number. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, I have another question about um, like you tested the models on different uh, imbalanced test sets. Mm -hmm. I wonder, do you know what's the uh, what's the ratio of of the disorder in in real world or in like in the? I think it was like less than less than the most extreme that we had. Uh, I think it was definitely less than one to one hundred that we had, but but mm -hmm. can't remember the actual the actual number. I do have a thirty two number, but not 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 hundred percent sure about it. Like one mm -hmm. to one one to thirty two. Okay, so that's that's pretty rare. It is, it is very rare. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for having me here. This was fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, I guess if there are no more questions from the audience, then we can uh, thank Sajid again for the wonderful talk. And we'll have the YouTube video uploaded um, by tonight. And so um, you can always reach out to Sajid or if you, forget his contact info, you can reach out to us and we'll put you in touch with him. So yeah, thanks course. everyone for joining today. Yeah. Thank you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And see you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.